If you're like most people, you lock your door before going to bed at night. It only makes sense. The world is a dangerous place and you never know who or what might be lurking in the shadows. Back when I was still brave enough to look out my windows after dark, I used to think about our ancestors. Huddled in caves and wondering if more than just the wind was howling in the black night beyond their fire's comforting glow. For me, the most basic human trait is in cooperation, tribalism, or even using tools. It's fear. Like you, I lock my door at night to keep that darkness at bay. But when I do, I never ever look outside. If you peer through the windows of your house or the peephole of your apartment after dark, and I'm not suggesting that you do, you'll notice a few things right away. The first is stillness, if you're lucky. After all, there's no reason why someone or something should happen to be standing on your doorstep, waiting for you to look outside, waiting to sneer at you through that thin barrier before they come crashing into your home to do what they wish to you and the people you love. You won't notice anything like that. Probably, if you're lucky. What you will notice, however, are the shadows. It doesn't matter whether you're looking out at a carpeted hotel corridor, a freshly trimmed green lawn, or the ugly welcome mat of your neighbor across the hallway. There will always be shadows. And most of the time, they behave themselves. A shift in the shadows or a shadow where one shouldn't be. That's the first sign that something is wrong. But most people aren't paying enough attention to realize what's changed. It's perfectly understandable. Maybe you're still frustrated by an argument at work, or exhausted from trying to bathe the fussy baby. Given what we all go through every day, why would you notice that the long black shadows of the trees in your yard are stretching toward the dying sunset instead of away from it? Why would you think that the dark shape flickering above the elevator is anything other than a helpless moth trapped inside of a wall lamp? Now, after your quick peek outside, you probably feel safe, content. There are no unknown horrors on your porch. No insanely grinning figures are creeping down your apartment hallway, tiptoeing with impossible, exaggerated strides. There are no threats beyond your window, the chain lock, or the peephole. None that you're aware of, anyway. If you're lucky, there will be other more pronounced signs that a change is taking place. If you're not, well, these shadows might be the only warning that you get. I was one of the lucky ones. I had so many subtle hints that something wasn't right. But like most people, I didn't pay attention until it was too late. I was 22 that summer and I had just moved in with my friends Juan, Paul, and Cassandra. The house was a grey two-story rental on a floodplain beneath the railroad tracks. It was nothing special, but it was walking distance from our college and we could afford the rent. As often happens with new roommates, it took us a while to get used to each other's quirks. Paul had an irritating habit of leaving half-empty mugs and cups all over the house. Juan was an early riser who completed his morning workout to pounding techno music and I'm sure that I had more than my fair share of personality flaws myself. The only thing annoying about Cassandra, however, seemed to be just how superstitious she was. She avoided ladders and black cats like the plague. Every time she spilled salt, she tossed a pinch of it over her shoulder. I considered asking her if she wore a pair of lucky socks to her exams, but I decided that I was better off not knowing. It was a windy night at the end of August. Juan was on a date with a girl from our statistics class. Paul had gone to some fundraiser for his fraternity, and Cassie and I had been left alone in the house. She was studying something at the kitchen table, her frizzy auburn hair hanging over her face. I had just come downstairs for a late night snack. The wind might not even have been all that severe, but in our rattling tin-roofed rental house, it seemed it. Before I went to bed, I at least wanted to see how bad it was. What are you doing? Cassandra stopped, fiddling with her pen and looked up suddenly. Uh, checking outside? 
I'm about to lock the door and go to bed. Well, I'd do one or the other, not both. At first, I thought that I had missed something. And then with my hand on the door, I got a sinking feeling. This was probably another one of Cassie's stupid superstitions. Why shouldn't I do both? I finally sighed. Oh, it's something my grandmother said. She used to say that there are wicked things out there in the dark, searching for a pair of eyes to let them in. There was a long pause. Look, I know that it sounds stupid, okay, but just do it for me. It did sound stupid, and I also felt a sudden need to check on my car, which was parked beneath a half-dead sycamore across the street. I figured Cassie would hear it if I opened the door, but a quick peek out the long side window while I turned the key in the lock couldn't hurt, right? It was a weird night. The trees swayed from side to side like they were performing some kind of macabre dance. Below them, plastic bags and newspapers blew by on the uneven sidewalk. The ordinarily comforting glow of the streetlights suddenly looked orange, flickery, and wrong but at least no branches had fallen on my car. I smirked, said goodnight to Cassie, and went upstairs to bed. Maybe it's just my contradictory nature, but after Cassie more or less forbade us from looking outside when we had locked the door, I started finding more and more excuses to do so. I had to check for a package. I had left a drink on the porch. I wasn't sure if I had left the outdoor lights on or not. They all came down to the same thing, trying to figure out just what it was about the evening ritual. So familiar to everyone I knew that had Cassie so spooked. Juan's theory was that the grandmother's story was made up, and that Cassie had been attacked while checking outside her door. Paul, who wasn't exactly a sensitive soul, assumed that she had some kind of mental disorder. I could care less how crazy she is. He sneered one night while Cassie was out as long as she pays her share of the rent on time. The problem was Cassandra seemed less and less crazy to me with each passing day. When I would check for deliveries before locking the door, I would get an awful feeling that somebody was watching me from the gloom below the trees across the street. I would notice it again the way the streetlights would seem to dim and change color, the way their shadows would reach out for me like long skeletal fingers. The hair on the back of my neck would suddenly stand up, but I was sure that there was no one there. Just uneven sidewalks, dewy grass, dark silent houses and those somehow malevolent shadows that seemed to tilt the wrong way. It got to the point that I didn't dare look up from the welcome mat when I checked for packages. I was too terrified of who or what. I might find suddenly standing in front of me. I knew that I should talk to Cassie about what I was experiencing, but part of me was still convinced that I had freaked myself out over nothing. And another part, the stubborn part, just didn't want to admit that she had been right. As it turned out, Cassie was visiting a friend in another state when the danger began to deepen. Once again, I was alone in the house. I had just turned the key when I heard a loud thump against the door. I reversed the lock and I pulled open the handle. I saw a dead bird laying on the welcome mat. What the? I was about to bend down and inspect it, maybe even pick it up when I saw the figure in the corner of the porch. Even now, I couldn't say for sure whether it was a person, a monster, or just a trick of the light. Whatever it was, it was bulky, dark, and over six feet tall. I remember something that could have been a leathery wing or maybe just a black trench coat. Scarred, bloated skin, like a drowning victim's, round, hungry, and horribly human eyes. I screamed and ran back inside, but no monstrous hand reached through the doorway after me. The neighbor's pit bull barked, a light flashed on in the house across the street, but otherwise the night was silent. There was no sign of whatever I had seen out there. I turned the key in the lock with a shaking hand and hauled myself upstairs. 
I didn't dare to look out the window a second time. I had barely reached my bedroom when a massive slam sent the front door flying open. Heavy footsteps creaked across the floor down below. A hand bashed into the wall, feeling for something, maybe the light switch. I froze, too scared to breathe and heard, giggling. Juan and his girlfriend Adriana, drunken, trying to find their way to his bedroom. He shushed her, warning her that his roommate was asleep, but that only made her giggle harder. I let out a sigh of relief and I climbed into bed. The next morning, Juan made breakfast for the three of us. My fears felt foolish in the bright morning light, but something was different about him. He watched me out of the corner of my eye as I ate, like there was something that he wanted to tell me. When Adriana finally scurried off to the bathroom, he leaned over and asked in a low voice if I knew the big guy who had been standing on our porch the night before. Later in my bedroom, I noticed a pair of massive, greasy handprints on my window. That night, I did the opposite of what I should have. After sunset, I left the porch light on, obsessively peering the long, narrow window beside the door each time that I passed. Nothing, nothing, and more nothing. A distant rumble of thunder announced the arrival of a late summer storm. Paul was upstairs catching up on some chemistry homework. Juan was taking a shower, and as the rain began to fall, I felt very, very alone. I hadn't told the others about what I had been going through. I had mentioned something about a suspicious character who I had seen hanging around the house, but I left it at that. The truth was, I would have taken any explanation, a stalker, a pranker, even that I was going crazy, rather than believe that any of it was really happening. I checked out the narrow door side window yet again. It was hard to see in the dark and rain. Wait, dark rain? What about the porch light? A huge, horrible eye blinked back at me. The face that it belonged to was large enough to take up the entire window, blocking out the light. I fell backwards with a shriek, running footsteps, Juan naked except for a towel wrapped around his waist. Paul, pale and irritated that I had broken his concentration, I stammered something about some guy on the porch. But of course, there was no one there when Juan opened the door, one fist around his tiny towel, the other up in the air like he was ready to fight the devil with it. Just my luck to move in with a bunch of nutcases, Paul muttered under his breath and stomped back up to his room. Juan shot me a worried look and then closed the door and locked it. Still shaking, I went back to my room and sat in the dark. My fist, white knuckled tight around the baseball bat that was the closest thing to a weapon that I owned. I thought seriously about trying to buy a gun, but background checks in my state take at least 48 hours, and I wasn't sure that I had that long. And what about Cassie? I should have thought of it before. She was the one who had mentioned the weird superstition in the first place. Maybe she would have some idea about what was going on. I pulled on my phone and gave her a call, and then another, but she didn't pick up. I wasn't surprised. She was probably enjoying a night out with the friends that she was visiting. Outside the rain fell harder, crashing in torrents against our rental's tin roof. In other circumstances, it might have been a soothing sound, but not being able to hear what was going on in the rest of the house was making me nervous. With my hands still wrapped around my baseball bat, I lay down on my bed and waited for what would come next. The buzz of my phone jarred me from sleep so roughly that I nearly hit myself in the face with my own makeshift weapon. Cassie, I picked up right away. Hey, you called? Rumbling, voices, announcements over an intercom. She was in public transport somewhere and her voice sounded like it was echoing down a tunnel. I don't think she understood my incoherent explanation of these strange events around our house, but she could hear the fear in my voice. For a long moment, I heard nothing but background noise. I'm sorry, Cassie said, 
like a doctor giving a terminal diagnosis. If it's gotten that far, then it's already too late. Downstairs, the doorbell rang. I double-checked my phone screen. It was after 3 a.m. and nobody should have been visiting that late and yet. There were sounds of movement. Juan, he was actually going to answer it. I gotta go, I told Cassie, but it was already too late. Adriana, what are you doing here? I couldn't see what was happening, but I could imagine it. Juan half asleep, a dark shape that looked like his rain-drenched girlfriend shivering on her porch, lit only from behind by streetlights. He opened the door just as I shouted out a warning. Two heartbeats later, it swung shut on its own. We never saw him again. Cassandra didn't come back to the house after that. Her scanty second-hand possessions were worth next to nothing and gave us no clue of who she had been or where she had come from. The college refused to help with our search. Her information was private if there were no signs of foul play. She would simply be filed away with all the other countless students who had suddenly dropped out, with no notification for reasons of their own. The local police, meanwhile, acted completely unconcerned about Juan's disappearance. During the smoke break they took on our porch, I overheard them joking about how my med student roommate had probably just been deported. I moved out too, of course. I cared more about avoiding the next horror that might happen in that house than I did about breaking a lease, and I crashed on couches until I found a free roam. Paul continued a living in the rental, muttering about broken promises and new age crazies. Eventually, he got new roommates, and to the best of my knowledge, none of them ever looked out the window before locking the door. Since then, neither have I. There have been a few close calls, sudden sounds that come from just outside my door, almost shocking enough to make me press my eye to the peephole. Other nights, the bell will ring the moment that I slide the key into the lock, like something was out there teasing me. The worst, though, are the voices. Wands, an elderly woman who I can only assume was Cassie's grandmother. Voices that call my name sweetly from the dark, asking me if anyone's home. <laughs>